He was a comic genius ahead of his time. Everybody else comes after Buster Keaton. He was probably the best physical comedian ever. He was the best there ever was. To me, I can't imagine what that history of comedy would have been without a Keaton. Thankfully, we have him, you know? Thank God. He's a force of nature, Buster Keaton. A filmmaker of such profound talent, his influence is still seen in Hollywood today. As quickly as Buster Keaton skyrocketed to stardom, he lost it all. Divorced, bankrupt, and alcoholic. Only to shock the world by coming back bigger and better than ever. Thousands of people came from all around to watch Buster Keaton film the climactic scene of his epic masterpiece, The General. Months of meticulous work had gone into planning the scene, which was to be shot at Culp Creek, Oregon. When Keaton gave the signal for shooting to begin, he unleashed the most incredible and the most expensive shot in silent film history. As the locomotive raced across the burning bridge, People screamed in fear as the Texas dropped 35 feet below into the Rove River. Someone else would have, you know, faked it, used a miniature, but not Keaton. He destroyed a real train to make it as authentic as he could. The general was perhaps one of the greatest period pieces ever made up to that point. Inspired by D.W. Griffith's landmark film, Birth of a Nation, Buster took cinema to its next level by recreating the Civil War with painstaking detail. It has everything in it. It's an incredible motion picture. Every frame looks like a Matthew Brady a photograph. He wanted it to be so accurate that it hurts, was his phrase. Buster based the general on a real-life Civil War event, adding a love story to the mix. In it, Keaton stars as Johnny Gray, a railroad engineer and unlikely war hero. When Johnny's locomotive, the general, is hijacked by Union troops, the action begins. I laughed all the way. <laughs> For me, it's a, it's a comedy masterpiece. It's just full of brilliant ideas. I mean, just the scene of Buster on a train, and behind him, the Civil War is taking place. Just like, and behind him, the Civil War. The depth of the comedy and the production involved, that he's got that scene happening, and that's not the focus. And I love watching it with director friends who are just amazed, you know, how he pulled it off. How did he do that? While filming The General, Buster Keaton was at the height of his career, a major Hollywood star. Yet, the film was plagued by several unexpected tragedies, which drove costs to spiral out of control. By far, the biggest disaster was a massive brush fire sparked by one of the engines. Even after the blaze had been battled, the smoke that hung in the air made filming impossible. So they had to go back to Los Angeles and wait for a rain which could take up to four or six weeks before they could return to Oregon to finish the film. At the time, Buster and his wife Natalie had recently completed construction on their new home in Beverly Hills, California. A 10,000 square foot mansion, it easily overshadowed any one of Keaton's film sets. Although Buster's taste was more modest, Natalie had insisted upon a showplace that would rival other movie star mansions. The Keatons entertained lavishly at their new estate, yet Buster felt more at home on a movie set. When he made pictures, he ate, slept, and dreamed them. He wasn't much of a family man. I mean, he lived for his work. That's what he knew. That's what he did best. The only aspect of the industry he ignored was the business side. He produced, he directed, he wrote, and he acted in them. 
and other people get credit, part credit, but Buster, Buster was a true auteur. He was in total, total demand. In his own world, however, Buster was losing control. Unwittingly, he had set the stage for an even bigger train wreck in his personal life than he had for the silver screen. Over the next few years, Buster would lose his film studio and creative control over his career. He would also lose the Italian villa in one of the ugliest divorces Hollywood has ever seen, his two sons legally stripped of their last name, Keaton. He would be reduced from one of the highest paid stars to a $100 a week gag writer. Bankrupt and depressed, he would nearly kill himself by drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. After a scandalous second marriage and divorce, he would hit rock bottom at the age of 40. Unable to stop drinking, he would be strapped in a straitjacket and locked inside a psychiatric ward. For a man with so much talent and so much to live for, it was impossible for those around him to understand why he had appeared to have given up on life. With his deadpan on-screen alter ego, Buster had won the hearts of millions of fans. They related to the character they nicknamed the Great Stone Face. He was the Great Stone Face. You know, nothing would get him riled. Nothing. Whatever was happening around him, he just cut back to Buster's face, which would look impassive, but the audience read the reaction into his expressions. He kind of just, all right, very accepting of everything to the, to the point of almost being oblivious to what's around him, even though everything around him is falling all over him. When the general tanked at the box office, it put into play a series of cataclysmic events that not even Buster would be able to ignore. On the set of Steamboat Bill Jr. the following year, Buster finally faced the fact that his personal and professional worlds were crashing down around him. It would take him years to triumph over his demons, but he would surprise the world with an incredible second act. On the set of Steamboat Bill Jr., people were praying for Buster Keaton's life. At the moment when the half-ton house facade came crashing down, even the cameraman had to look away. He took chances that nobody else ever took. They made their markings on the floor, but if he was over just, just a touch, that building would have flattened him. It would have been the end of Buster Keaton. Behind Buster's trademark frozen face is a depth of misery never seen before. Right before the scene was shot, he was told the Buster Keaton studio was going to close. Keaton later said that, uh, you know, knowing this information, and the state of his marriage to Natalie Talmadge being as in bad shape as it, as it was at that time, that he really didn't care much about anything and he willingly put himself through this dangerous routine, really not caring if he lived or died. Buster's talent for pulling off dangerous stunts with a stony face had come from a lifetime of hard work, developed on stage as a part of his family's act, the Three Keatons. Well, I think it was like in the womb, he was already a star. By the time he was four years old, he was literally being tossed across the stage into scenery, becoming a stunt kid. That's really the basis of their whole act. And it was a very knockdown, drag out act. Buster was called the human mop. Had a little handle sewn on his back and he was thrown into the wings or against the scenery or sometimes into the audience, depending upon the old man's mood. According to Keaton family legend, it was friend and fellow vaudevillian Harry Houdini who renamed little Joseph Frank Keaton the sixth Buster. Apparently, Keaton fell down a flight of steps all the way to the bottom when he was about two years old. And Houdini saw this and said, that's sure a Buster. The Keatons noticed that the audience laughed harder when Buster kept a straight face. So by the age of nine or 10, that uh, stoic expression, that blank face, 
was part of his uh, act. It was just mechanical with him. Putting strain on the family act was the fact that Joe Keaton was an alcoholic. Joe, the father's drinking, had increased, and Buster found his timing was off, which was dangerous because of the way they worked. And uh, Buster was ready to be on his own. After turning 21, Buster struck out on his own and moved to New York. Within weeks, a chance meeting with an old friend led him to the Comique Film Studio. That day, his life radically changed when he met Joseph Skank, the Talmadge sisters, and Roscoe Arbuckle. Joseph Skank, the owner of Comic, was one of the great independent producers of the era. He was married to Norma Talmadge. The Talmadge sisters were very popular. Norma Talmadge was the dramatic actress, and the youngest sister, Constance, had a flair for comedy. And Natalie really didn't have the talent of the other two sisters, but she worked at the uh, Arbuckle Company. Immediately, Buster was as smitten with Natalie, a pretty brunette, as he was with the film studio. Skank's most famous star, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, offered to personally show him around. He was fascinated. He was fascinated with behind the scenes, you know, the camera and the film and how, all the different process. He had no formal education. The man only spent one day of his life in school. But he had a natural flair for mathematics and was just technically minded. So he just was fascinated with the motion picture camera and anything technical. After the tour, Arbuckle offered Buster a part in his next movie. Keaton's first film with Arbuckle was The Butcher Boy. Shot without a script, Buster was directed to buy some molasses from Arbuckle's character. Arbuckle was impressed with Keaton immediately because he did his first scene in one take. And the one thing that really impressed Arbuckle was Keaton's ability to take a sack of flour. He got hit so hard in the face with that sack of flour that he said his head wound up where his feet had been. When they wrapped, Buster asked if he could borrow the camera. He took the camera home for the weekend, took it apart, put it together, put it apart, learned the shutter, how many shutter clicks in a second. He figured all that out. He just had a brilliant mind. Keaton and Arbuckle formed an immediate friendship and creative partnership. After a few films, Keaton was co-directing with Arbuckle and worked with Arbuckle in his scenario department, thinking up gags. In their early films, it's interesting to see Keaton still experimenting with his on-camera acting. In Coney Island, Buster is seen laughing and crying. He's working with a hammer, a big wooden hammer that rings a bell. Arbuckle's going by just as he swings the hammer and he knocks Arbuckle down. And Buster looked and started to laugh. And he didn't like it. He didn't like the laugh. And he also felt that if the actor laughed, the audience didn't. Try to make the audience laugh. The comedies became so successful, Comique moved to the West Coast so they could film year round. Natalie moved with the company, and it was in California, a romance between her and Buster began to blossom. In 1918, Buster's film career came to a sudden and unexpected halt when he was called to serve in World War II. handle anything, we put them to the ultimate test. Dads, alone with their babies, and the Navy Seals. Dads, alone with their babies, at nap time, after a very full feeding. Can the leak stay locked through a long, milk-induced slumber? No leaks here. Grab a dad and see for yourself how compared to Pampers Baby Dry, Huggies all-new Snug and Dry stops After his return, there. a series of shocking events would take place. Arbuckle would fall from grace in the biggest scandal in Hollywood history, and Buster Keaton would skyrocket to stardom. During his seven months in France as a soldier in World War I, 
Buster Keaton and Natalie Talmadge kept in touch by letter. When the war ended, he returned to California and reunited with best friend and creative collaborator, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Together, they made three more comedy shorts at Comique Studio. Their last film, The Garage, was Buster's favorite. Besides the usual slapstick, highly advanced mechanical props and a subtler, more sophisticated style of humor can be seen. Buster's acting ability was also gaining notice. When Douglas Fairbanks passed on the role of Bertie Van Alstyne in the film The Saphead, he recommended they cast Keaton instead. With his low-key, charming performance, Buster surprised audiences with his acting range. By now, Arbuckle was so hot that Paramount Pictures bought his contract, promising him an unheard of $3 million. With Arbuckle's departure, Skank created the Buster Keaton Studio. Although the studio no longer stands, its location is an historic site. It can be found in the heart of Hollywood at the intersection of Eleanor Avenue and Lillian Way. With the Buster Keaton Studio, Skank gave Buster full creative control over the production of 19 comedy shorts. He had no money worries. Joe Skank just paid the bills as producer and let Keaton do what he wanted, as long as he made money. In those days, they always had to shoot every scene at least twice. One take was used to make a negative for domestic distribution prints. The second was shot to send overseas. Buster Keaton films were becoming wildly popular with Europeans. They worked six days a week. And the only day off they had was Sunday, and they were hitting the boards at six in the morning to go to work. So, and their, their work was paramount. They just, you know, they loved what they were doing. The first film Buster released was called One Week. It's a parody of an industrial film on prefab housing that Buster had seen. The plot revolves around newlyweds setting up home, literally. It's such a tremendous leap forward in terms of uh, production value, visual style, and story from the Arbuckle films just shortly before. It was just a great launch for Keaton, and it was the, the, the comedy hit of 1920 and really put him on the map. Buster's next film had to be scrapped when he broke his foot on the set. The downtime allowed him to concentrate on his personal life. After a mysterious on-again, off-again engagement, he and Natalie married on May 31st, 1921. And it was a strange combination, this Buster Keaton, this strange character from the vaudeville stage, and Natalie Talmadge coming from this Talmadge family of great actors on the screen. And many people thought it wouldn't work. It just didn't seem right. Three weeks after their wedding, Buster and Natalie posed for a gag photo, pretending to be a miserable married couple. Unfortunately, the truth was not far away. Problems between them began almost immediately. Buster became frustrated by Natalie's obsession with shopping and her apparent loyalty to her sisters. Natalie, in turn, was upset over the amount of time Buster spent away from home. Even though his foot hadn't completely healed, Buster went back to work to make The Playhouse. Because he couldn't rely on his usual acrobatic stunt work, he decided to dazzle the audience with the help of in-camera special effects. Buster plays all the roles, and they did this through, through, through uh, multiple exposure. And only Keaton was making these type of extremely clever comedies, and it's, it's one of his best films, no question about it. Once Buster had healed, he went back to filming his trademark physically challenging comedies in and around Los Angeles. At the time, Hollywood was known as a city of sin. During the 1920s and into the 30s, Hollywood was always known as being a place where there's kind of vice going on and drinking, drugs, etc., etc., and there was, absolutely. While not everyone in Hollywood partied, Keaton and Arbuckle were among those who occasionally indulged. In the midst of filming The Boat in September 1921, 
Buster received an invitation from Arbuckle to attend a party up in San Francisco. Buster was not able to attend. What was planned as a weekend of fun turned into a lifetime of hell for Roscoe. He was arrested for the rape and manslaughter of Virginia Repe. In Arbuckle, his sin was that he had a bootleg party in, the, in an era of prohibition. And despite his eventual acquittal, public opinion had already tried him in the press, and he was banished from the screen by the newly formed, what we now call today the Motion Picture Association of America. As much as Buster wanted to testify on the behalf of his friend, he was counseled not to by Arbuckle's lawyer, who felt Buster's Hollywood fame would not be well regarded by the jury. Devastated, Buster stayed in Southern California and continued to make films. Behind the scenes, he arranged for a percentage of his profits to go to support Arbuckle. It was around this time that some have speculated Buster's art began to imitate his life. After the birth of his first son, whom he named Joseph Keaton VII, Natalie's sisters moved in and took over. Soon after, he made My Wife's Relations. Some see the heartless brothers depicted in the film as an inside joke about his sisters-in-law. Upsetting Buster even more was Natalie's later rejection of the baby's name, Joseph. She christened him James. Buster had always been close to his father, Joe. Despite a childhood some considered to be abusive, Buster had always maintained that he had enjoyed growing up on the road in his family's act. Buster even hired his father to perform in many of his films, including Daydreams and The Electric House. In Neighbors, he cast his father to play his father. Buster's vaudevillian childhood is clearly the inspiration for Convict 13. Convict 13 uh, was about three quarters of it was their vaudeville act. And Buster was half the time he was a convict and half the time he was a, a guard. He was playing two th sides of the coin. And his dad was the, in there doing all their vaudeville stuff. That same year, Keaton made his last two-reeler, The Love Nest. He now had his eye on bigger things. He was anxious to join the ranks of Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd. Buster was ready to enter the world of feature films. Did you explain to Angie the story isn't true? There's no use explaining. She insists on believing that I'm bad. And I'm not, honest I'm not. When Buster Keaton transitioned from two-reelers to feature-length films, he evolved into a master filmmaker. With the longer films came a larger salary. Although Buster was content with his relatively modest lifestyle and the home they owned, Natalie insisted they start living like celebrities. While Buster and Natalie ran in the same social circles as Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd, Buster was a distant third at the box office. Also unlike Chaplin and Lloyd, Keaton decided his feature comedies should be different from his comedy shorts. When he got into features, then he said they had to get down and be serious about a good beginning, a good ending, and then the middle would kind of fill itself. But they had to have a good plot or they wouldn't do it because you couldn't do just hokey jokes for a feature. Buster's first feature was Three Ages, shot in 1923. It's a parody of D.W. Griffith's Intolerance and is an hysterical look at love through the ages. Although Buster was becoming more story conscious, he still didn't work with a script. Even more amazing was the fact that Buster improvised most of his physical stunts as he went along, and he always did them himself. He once told me that over the course of his career, at one time or another, he broke every bone in his body, including his neck. During the filming of Three Ages, while attempting to jump from one roof to another, Buster came up shy and hit the wall. Instead of scrapping the footage, Buster worked it into the plot, making it one of his most memorable scenes.
While at first opposed to joining Buster on location in Northern California for the filming of his second feature, Our Hospitality, Natalie changed her mind when Buster offered her a starring role. While he had hoped it would strengthen their marriage, the intense amount of time together only served to show they were growing apart. Months later, after the birth of their second son, Robert, Natalie stunned Buster by announcing that she was ending their physical relationship. She would never have sex with him again. Buster swore he wouldn't live the remainder of his life without sex, and that he intended to find affection elsewhere. Although Keaton's marriage was failing, his studio was soaring. That year, they had an all-time box office best with The Navigator. The Navigator had been inspired by a prop. They found this steamship, and they leased it for $25,000. They had no story. They just knew that once they had the prop, a scenario would develop from it. That same year, Buster made Sherlock Jr., one of his most creative and highly regarded masterpieces. In it, he stars as a frustrated film projectionist who fantasizes about becoming a private detective. The following year, Buster had another hit with Seven Chances, a film that's still popular today. I mean, even if you saw this today in a, in a cineplex, you go, wow, what a trip. But he was doing this and making this stuff happen without, you know, someone sitting in the computer, which is all cool, too, now. I don't know how he did it. Knockout punch. Unstoppable. Just the pace all the way to the end. Drives the audience crazy. They go nuts, and they walk out like they were crying from laughter. It's such a knockout. Buster had enough success with Go West in 1925 and Battling Butler in 1926 that he felt confident to embark on his most ambitious feature to date. It would be the first and only time in silent cinema that a filmmaker attempted to combine the genres of comedy and historical epic. At $750,000, it was his most expensive film ever. And it was a flop. It is not the typical Keaton comedy. The, the gags are very subtle, and I don't think people were expecting that. They were expecting your usual type of Keaton comedy. People die in the general, and, you know, and at the time, people thought that was in bad taste. Today, we find it hilarious, but at that time, uh, some of Keaton's choices were called into question. It's like Citizen Kane didn't do well in the box office. You know, people weren't ready for it. The film was a turning point for Buster Keaton and executive producer Joseph Skank. Without much of a mind for business, Buster blinded himself to the harsh financial reality that the failure of the general would have on his studio. More and more, Hollywood was becoming a corporate town with little room for mavericks like Keaton. At home, he refused to confront Natalie about her shopping. Anxious to keep up with her two movie star sisters, she spent $900 a week on clothing alone. More ominous was the looming revolution in synchronized sound technology. The jazz singer had just played in movie theaters across America, wowing audiences everywhere. Buster's next picture was Steamboat Bill Jr. For it, he created the character of Willie Canfield, the well-educated son of macho steamboat captain Bill. Against all odds, I Willie can handle anything. We put them to the ultimate test. Dads, alone with their babies, at nap time, after a very full feeding. Can the leak stay locked through a long, milk-induced slumber? Too. Grab a dad and see for yourself. How compared to Pampers Baby Dry, Huggies all new Snug and Dry stops his disapproving there. father by saving the day in an unforgettable cyclone scene. Steamboat Bill Jr. did better at the box office, but it too was a financial disaster. It lost roughly a quarter of a million dollars. Not only were the films not making the money, but the era of independent production was coming to an end, and the big studio system was coming in. 
it really ushered in the end of his career as a great filmmaker. Buster only woke up and realized the state of his affairs when Joseph Skank told him Steamboat Bill Jr. would be his last film. Miserable in his marriage and unable to make a profit, Buster allowed Skank to sell his contract to MGM in what he would later call the greatest mistake of my life. She's gone crazy. Uh, Miss Pansy. Uh... Oh, you little nitwit, you. At the height of his creative powers, Buster Keaton was forced to give up his production company and sign a deal with MGM in 1928. Although he would later say this was the biggest mistake of his life, Buster actually had very little choice in the matter. Hollywood was now a dream factory controlled by the studios. The talkies had come with a big price tag. The cost of building special sound stages, along with new sound equipment, meant that Buster's freewheeling days of silent film shot on location were over. One of the unusual differences between Buster Keaton's way of making films and others is that uh, Keaton loved to shoot on location. Now, part of it was that it was fun, yes, but the other was an economical way of making the films. You don't have to make so many sets. Author John Bankston has hunted down many of the locations used by Buster for his book, Silent Echoes. Buster loved to film all over Southern California, but his favorite spot was this one block on Cahuenga between Hollywood and Soma. Here in the background is an alleyway that he used in Cops, where he grabbed a car and it threw him out of camera one-handed. In Hard Luck, Buster eludes the police by hiding among these statues. He captured a real time and place, and so he recorded history itself. And one thing that's so interesting about his films is that you can look into the background of his films and see some detail about how Los Angeles was in the 1920s or how things have changed uh, since then. The film that was shot here was Seven Chances. In Seven Chances, Buster needs to get married by seven o'clock that evening in order to inherit a fortune. And after bungling his proposal with his longtime girlfriend, he resorts to putting an ad in the newspaper. And unbeknownst to him, thousands of would-be brides show up on the steps of this church. Keaton's first movie at MGM, The Cameraman, would be his last great film. He was used to having his own little studio, his own autonomy. But then when he was put into this big factory of filmmaking, he was lost there. He simply didn't know how to work with those restraints. People looking over his shoulder, wondering how much this cost, how much that cost. Buster didn't care. He just didn't care. He wanted to do a picture that he was proud of, that he liked. Even though MGM was the biggest studio in town, Buster was its first comedy talent. With Spite Marriage in 1929, it's apparent that MGM had little understanding of what had made Buster so funny to so many. The character is changing a little bit. Um, he's becoming a little bit more sad and asking for sympathy, which is something he never did in his own films. On the set of Spite Marriage, Buster began an open affair with his leading lady, Dorothy Sebastian. Up until then, he had been discreet about his infidelities. That same year, MGM put Buster in his first sound picture, The Hollywood Review of 1929. Although starring, speaking roles wouldn't come until a year after that. Oh, thank you. I never drink. Oh, I know, but a little Tom Collins won't hurt you. Uh, what is the nature of this uh, Thomas Collins? Oh, um, it's sort of like uh, lemonade, only it's made from limes and a dash of that and a dash of that. Sort of like a fruit compo, you know? Very nice. While some people liked Buster's voice, others didn't. More upsetting for Buster was that it was the first time he played a guy who didn't get the girl. He found himself losing grip on his original status of being a silent comedian, a superstar in the world cinema. And he was relegated to becoming sort of like a character actor. And this caused him to drink. 
and he would eventually become absent from the studio for long periods. Buster rebelled by behaving like a bad boy. He held wild parties on the lot, angering the uptight Louis B. Mayer. He also began to have multiple and messy affairs. After taking bit player Kathleen Kitty Key home to have sex with her, he let her raid Natalie's closet. Later, it turned into a public relations nightmare when he dumped Kitty and she retaliated by beating him in public. He felt he was coming to an end, and of course, that doesn't bode well for his family and Natalie and his kids. Buster wasn't a saint, uh, not at all. But uh, he was a good, good person. I thought they performed beautifully. <laughs> You slay me with your crack. <laughs> Come on back. When MGM paired him up with the loudmouth funny man, Jimmy Durante, for three pictures, it put Buster over the emotional edge. The banal comedies did better box office than his own films had. Out of despair, he tried to numb the pain with a bottle of whiskey a day. He had a really tough go because his career was in the, in the toilet because the studio took his power away. And he was an alcoholic to boot, so... It was a rotten decade or so for him. He could have survived a failed marriage, but it was the fact that he had no control of his career, which was his life. He had been doing it all his life. This led him to the alcoholism, and this led to him going rock bottom. For the sardonically titled, What? No Beer, MGM hired a nurse, Mae Scrivens, to keep him sober. On his last day of shooting, Louis B. Mayer fired him. Not long after, Natalie filed for divorce. Seeking vengeance, she fought for and won nearly every penny Buster had, plus the Italian villa. Natalie also won custody of the boys and changed their last name from Keaton to Talmadge. Before his divorce was final, Buster disgraced himself further by marrying May Scrivens in what he claimed was an alcoholic blackout. Two years later, he was divorced again. Now at the age of 40, he was alone, alcoholic, and a has-been. Consumed by despair, he was unable to stop drinking. To save his life, he was put in a straitjacket and confined to a hospital psychiatric ward. From there, Buster could only go up. Just how high he would soar would surprise not only the world, but himself. Buster Keaton had been one of the greatest stars of the silent screen. He not only starred in his own comedies, but he wrote, directed, and edited them himself. With the revolution in sound technology, Buster lost his film studio. And for a while, he lost himself. After drying out in a sanatorium in 1935, Buster went straight home and drank two cocktails. After that, he stopped drinking completely for five years. He never attempted to kick his other addiction, however. He could go through four or five packs a day. He wouldn't finish a cigarette, necessarily, but he always was chain smoking. Almost out of pity, MGM hired Buster back as a $100 a week consultant. His comic genius still intact, Buster came up with gags for celebrities like the Marx Brothers and Red Skelton. A world-class bridge player, Buster played every day. When Eleanor Norris, an MGM dancer, showed up at a game, Buster was instantly attracted. Less than half his age, friends on both sides tried to split them apart. On May 29, 1940, Eleanor became Buster's number one leading lady. His third wife, Eleanor Keaton, was the right woman. She was just a darling woman and she took great care of him. They had a wonderful life, I'm happy to say. Buster also reconnected with his two sons, James and Robert. The two teenagers started visiting their father on a fairly regular basis, even though they did not have their mother's blessing to do so. As Buster's life stabilized, several invitations to appear on the other side of the camera came. He also frequently performed live on stage in Europe, where his popularity had never died. 
Although the films he had made in the 1920s and distributed throughout Europe were still in circulation, Buster had long since ceased to see any residuals. And now let's turn back the clock, 40 years, 1917, as we present Buster Keaton in The Can of Molasses. Buster became an actor for hire, available for almost anything, including the brand new medium, television. Television for Buster meant that live audience, which he loved. It's like going back to vaudeville. So he would restage all his old routines uh, from vaudeville and from his earliest films. Simon Pure Beer presents Buster Keaton. Here's an easier way. This easy-to-use zip-open top is all that stands between you and the delicious flavor of Simon Pure Beer. Invitations to appear in high-profile films, Sunset Boulevard and Limelight, quickly followed. I think he was surprised, incredibly surprised, almost disbelief about the resurgence in his career. Buster would soon be even more surprised by a shocking discovery. In 1955, the new owner of the villa, actor James Mason, found several Buster Keaton silent films thought to be long gone. The films eventually found their way into the hands of Buster's new business partner, Raymond Rohauer. By saving the prints from near disintegration and distributing them all over the world, Rohauer introduced Buster Keaton to a new, more appreciative audience. Buster's pictures have a depth today that people did not recognize in the 20s and the 30s because we were simpler. But now they do recognize it. The re-releases also inspired Hollywood's next generation. The people in the know, the, the smart people in the film industry, know Keaton's work and, and study Keaton's film. And I once did a, a sketch on television where I was a, a guy trying to mail a letter against the wind. And I stole all those moves from it. But those guys in those days didn't mind being stolen from. They were rather flattered. What, what Buster Keaton did with a gag was to make it as lean and mean and right on the money as possible. And I think that people in other generations, you know, even stand-ups, learn from that. By the late 1950s, Buster was finally able to afford a home. At long last, he built his dream house, a small ranch in Woodland Hills, California, 20 miles outside of Hollywood. Buster did not think about the past too much. He did not have regrets, recriminations, I should have done this, I should have done that, or damn them for doing that to me. Buster took full responsibility for his life, what happened to him, uh, both good and bad. Acknowledging that it was long overdue, the Motion Picture Academy awarded Buster with an honorary Academy Award in 1959. Although he said he might retire, Buster was busier than ever in the 60s. He appeared in a wide variety of projects with an even wider range of quality. Buster loved to work and needed to work because he needed it for both his soul and his uh, pocketbook. For his performance in Samuel Beckett's experimental short film, titled simply, Film, Buster was invited to the Venice Film Festival as a special guest. It was a five minute standing ovation. He wept and uh, he said, this is the first film festival I've ever been to, but I'm gonna come back and do some more. <laughs> A couple of months later, Buster was taken to the hospital for chronic coughing. Lung cancer was discovered. It was so far gone, it was inoperable. So they never told Buster for fear that it would put him in a panic. Tragically, he would not live to see the general finally make a profit and receive some of the highest honors in Hollywood. On February 1st, 1966, Buster Keaton died at the age of 70. A decade later, the American Film Institute named The General as one of the best 50 films of all time. He's more popular now than he was 
because he was ahead of his time, like many geniuses. At the centenary of his birth in 1995, tributes and festivals were held around the world in his honor. At long last, the world had finally caught up with Buster Keaton. Today, he is recognized as not only one of the original pioneers of Hollywood movie making, but one of the best. Through his films, which continue to amaze and delight audiences everywhere, Buster Keaton lives on.